to another episode of the Simply Trade News Roundup. Hi, Lalo. Hi, Andy. How are you on this beautiful Friday morning? Good morning. Good morning. Doing good. Yeah. Awesome. How are you? I am good. It's not morning, but it's been a good Friday. Um, ready for the weekend. And yeah, I'm going to binge watch. We talked about Netflix earlier, so I'm binge watch. Well, I hope you guys have watched Chrysalda because that's such a good show. But I'm binge watching <laughs> The Queen of South this weekend. So I'm really excited. It's I started it and I can't get enough. Anyways, not much trade. Actually, there's a lot of trade going on in those in those episodes, but not in the right way. <laughs> um, there's a lot of unfair business. And actually, going into the first article, okay, it's not that intense, but there's some unfair business going on that people are kind of getting bringing up to the table. So they're saying that um, the recent anti-dumping and countervailing duty petitions filed by the American Paper Plate Coalition against paper plates imports from China, Thailand, and Vietnam have brought attention to unfair trade practices in the paper plate industry. Um, seems like a tiny industry when you are a regular person, right? Because you, you just buy those paper plates off the store and maybe like what you buy those like once a year, maybe not, not even all, at all. Um, but to them, this is a huge deal. So I kind of want to talk about it. So I have a question towards this. Actually, let me find it. Okay, here we go. So while you're doing um, that, let's just remind folks what we're talking about. This is the National Law Review. And there's an allegation that the paper plate industry is uh, suffering due to paper plates being manufactured in China, Thailand, and Vietnam. So are there any anticipated challenges or obstacles that exporters and importers of paper plates may face during this course of the investigation? Because, I mean, there's not a certain standpoint yet, or I mean, people have standpoints, but there's not an outcome yet. So during this inv investigation, what may exporters and importers do that are dealing with paper plates, especially from those countries? Well, the allegation is, is that paper plates that are uh, manufactured, again, China, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam are being sold in the U.S. as they're being imported and sold in the U.S. below market value. And, and, and more specifically, the, the idea is that <clears throat> it's, it's a dumping uh, activity. So that the, those goods are coming in and being sold for less than what it takes to manufacture those items is, again, the allegation. And so that's going through with uh, an investigation to take a look at it. And what the reason somebody would do that is they're trying to gain market share and hurt the, you know, if you will, the domestic business and, and put somebody out of business. Yeah, they definitely... Um... Also mentioned, you said countervailing duties, Andy, but they also mentioned that they suspect that there's also um, uh, government aid to those manufacturers to allow them to dump this in the U.S. So it's not only going to be anti-dumping, but it's also going to be countervailing what they're seeking. And so that that's a lot more serious because countervailing is in the triple digit percentage um, duties versus, you know, 30, 40, 50% on the anti dumping or whatever, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's gonna, I mean, it, like Annex said, it sounds silly us talking about paper plates or whatever, but I mean, <laughs> it, it, it actually, it actually expands to beyond that, you know, right now we're talking about paper plates, but it's, I mean, it's present in a lot of industries, um, or commodities, let's say, um, you know, so it goes on every day. And so it's just something to be aware of. If you're if you're an importer, you think your product may not be subject to any anti-dumping or countervailing duties, but that may not be the case, especially when we have a client right now who's asking us about um, steel rope, uh, which is 
not even manufactured in the U.S., but the, unfortunately, the steel is subject to anti-dumping. All right. And that's that for paper plates today, ladies and gents. Um, <laughs> we're going to something, a positive outlook. Please, no one turn this into an, anything negative. <laughs> Andy, I'm talking to you. Um, but anyways, <laughs> so... So this article says that IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, right, says global soft landing inside lifts 2024 growth outlook. So ultimately, they were saying that um, they're obviously forecasting a soft landing and an uplifted growth outlook for 2024. The report cities stronger private and public spending, lower energy and commodity prices, and increased labor force participation as contributing factors to the positive forecast. Um, which sounds awesome. Hello, we're here for it because that's exactly what we need. I know it's not all butterflies and rainbows out there, though. And there's obviously such as they're also mentioning the Red Seas crisis and geopolitical tensions, which have been rising lately. And we've been talking about those a lot. So obviously nothing is all flowers and rainbows and everything. But um, that is what the IMF said or has that's their outlook for 2024. So I just wanted to ask, um, since this is out there in the world, you know, this kind of growth outlook, um, what do people do? Um, like, do they strategize their pricing or like, are they going to adapt to things that, I mean, they're reading, you know, adapt their pricing, their strategies, like with this kind of outlook, or do you stay the same? Because obviously we're looking for change. And I know you have to look at the industry to adapt your changes, but what if you, like, I feel like there needs to be a certain start. And do you think there's, there could be a start now, or do you think it, it still takes a little while for that to happen? I just don't like, you know, when these, these folks are full of beans, a big bag of hot air or something. That said, I will also say that, really, I'm pretty optimistic. I'll go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me. That, going through all of this, I'm like, you got to be realistic. So what do you do with it? it? You know, the outlook, okay, the growth rates are below average. Um, and so I will tell you, if we are in for some uh, mediocre results when you're below average, but businesses just, it's just like if you're going out and you're in a, in a sailing, uh, boat of some kind or a sailing yacht. If the winds change, you don't stop where you're going. You have to adjust your sails and you may have to adjust, uh, your route slightly. Uh, and start zigzagging if the winds are against you, but you can still make your way across the ocean. That's the thing here is all I'm getting at is that let's not kid ourselves. We need to adjust ourselves to say it's not going to be this rambunctious on a great time. Oh, inflation's down. No, inflation is not down. The growth rate of inflation, it has been reduced from the maximum of, you know, five, six, seven percent in some of these places. You just have to adjust your sales. What I was going to say that in the spirit of Groundhog's Day, which is today. <laughs> that is, I did see that. I did yes. see that. Although I, well, did, wait, I did see that. Um, Ponsatani Phil predicted an early, early spring. So we, we, are, we are looking at an early spring. However, let me just put it, and I'm going to totally tie this in. So, so bear with me. Um, it's still not wise to put away those winter coats and umbrellas or whatever you might do, you know, um, keep, keep your heater still running, etc. you know, cause all it is, it's a groundhog's prediction <laughs> and same thing here. This is just an outlook or a prediction of trade. And so it's good news, I guess, if it's, if it's true or if it's going to happen, I mean, it, it, it's, it's good to, Think positive and and hope that this is going to work out. But however, <laughs> don't put away or let your guard down. So I have a few things. I mean, you can uh, embrace the uncertainty. You know, you you can just embrace it and think, okay, um, 
the groundhog may say that it's early spring, but it, it but it still might be a long winter. So I mean, but still be prepared for anything that might happen, right? And uh, stay informed. You know, go to training uh, here at Global Training Center or whatnot. You know, and just prepare yourselves, right? Um, and then something that we've been talking a lot about here uh, recently on our shows, um, especially since uh, actually literally since the, all of 2024, almost every one of our shows have talked about data um, um, being a big factor for 2024. So make that a theme for your 2024. Um, make data driven decisions because follow the data, right? Um, even last year, we had Craig Fuller on. Uh, from freight waves and in spite of the market in spite of everything that was saying that the freight market was still in a good shape freight waves called it and they said no it's a, we're heading for a big fall and a etc and people did not like that um in the industry but he was right or they were right um and uh because they followed the data they, they you know so that's another thing and of course, just always build resiliency, you know, find a different sourcing uh, in case something may affect you. Like what happened in the Red Sea, right? You know, um, who would have known that the that 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 war in the Middle East was going to happen um, and your shipments couldn't get through the Red Sea, for God's sakes, you know, like who, who would have ever even thought of that in August, right? Now that's happening, but I mean, if you had built-in resiliency again, you know, and if you're nearshored, for example, versus getting stuff sourced out in way out there in China or whatever, um, or places that require transport through the Red Sea, I mean, you you'd be a little more resilient. So, last article we haven't talked about China, or maybe we have, um, but we're going back to talking about China. Because China comes close to overtaking Japan as the world's largest car exporter. Um, well, we know that China's trying to rule the world, which kind of, I mean, they're exceeding, right? Um, so how does China emergence, like how does China's emergence as a major car exporter affect the export strategy and competition in the global market. Um, I mean, I know Germany is pretty big on car exports, but what does that mean for China? Well, China, first off, is not, you, you don't see Chinese vehicles being sold here in the U.S. I'm not aware of any. I had to literally go online and look them, look them up going, oh, I didn't even realize China was made, uh, an auto manufacturer. In that, I got to say, they are nice. Uh, you know, they're designed very nice. They look good. Um, as I also mentioned, there's some, uh, you know, when uh, you think of some of that, you think of some of these ugly looking things or whatever. It must be really horrible. They're not. They're actually, you know, nice looking vehicles. I don't know about the quality and the uh, the, the uh, longevity of the vehicles and, and whatnot. But the, there's a few of those vehicles I said uh they're like a biscuit that squatted to rise. It's just, uh, it just, they look like they've been smushed or whatever in the back end. Hey, we have those here a lot too. They're called minis. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, there's a Wait, lot of different vehicles. Me, yeah. You're going to want it once you're in a, once you're trying to find a parking spot. Oh, I know. The anywhere. smaller vehicles. <laughs> I, I, I have driven in several places there in Germany and in uh, France. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's not a, you know, and I like big vehicles and all that, mm, not over there. But anyway, that said, um, China exported almost 6 million vehicles, 5.97 mi uh, million That's vehicles, crazy. uh, according to, to the where? article. Uh, apparently China exported 5.22 million. So 550,000 vehicles less than Japan. Uh, in the mix, apparently, uh, China did export more passenger vehicles, uh, so that means probably more uh, pickups or whatever were ex or and or vans or something were uh, exported by uh, Japan. But regardless, in the overall scheme of things, here's the thing: China's main customer is Russia. Second to that, you have uh, apparently Mexico has. Uh, uh, is, Wait. Wait, are no, you it saying says that Mexico? Hmm? 
I thought it said Mexico was number two, right? Yeah, no? Mexico was number two. Russia is the number oh, I one thought, I, uh, oh, uh, buyer I thought it was of number Chinese two. vehicles. Oh, okay. oh I okay. looked it up and it said the main destination of cars export from China are Belgium, United Kingdom, United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Yeah, but Russia is the number one it, it, the biggest buyer because so many with the sanctions – there have been so it's many auto uh, manufacturers and all that that have stopped doing business with Russia because of the sanctions. Well, China is still in that void. Um, and then you, the other vehicles you were talking about are other countries. But Mexico, I understand, is number two destination. And then it goes from there for the other European locations. The point being is that in this, where Russia is still able to gain you know, new vehicles and whatnot for their economy and uh, and all of that. So, you know, when we're talking about some of these sanctions and all that, this goes back to the same deal where the U.S. dollar, there's a group of countries trying to move away from using the U.S. dollar in international transactions as the currency for exchange. And that's how they circumvent all this. And there you go. So, it's just a matter of time. China's going to continue on uh, with trying to, you know, keep on with their uh, manufacturing and all that. And they're obviously now a major player of uh, vehicles uh, around the world. And it's it's also indicative where I think Mexico, uh, in Mexico, the third largest exporter of vehicles, I, according to the article. Yeah, that's. That's crazy. Well, that's, oh, the main export. That's because oh, a lot of American, exporter. a lot of American cars are manufactured in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So that, that mm -hmm. they, they don't really keep it for domestic use. I mm -hmm. mean, it's mostly for export. And so obviously that, that raises their exporting. It's not that Mexico is, has a Mexican brand. Right, right. It, it, that yeah, they're exporting. Yeah. They're, they're the exporting trade. American cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's crazy that Russia really so I because I looked at a chart and it said that Belgium was the main um, country that got Ch like th that China exported to, which is crazy because that's not the case because I looked at 2021 and then I realized that in 2023, auto shipments to Russia rose about six times that of 2022, which is insane because everyone cut off Russia and China was like, give all the cars to Russia. <laughs> like what? Why 2023? That's crazy. That's just weird. They're having they're having an alliance for some. Well, yeah, I don't it's, know what it's, and it's moving more and more to you know where they're That's bolstering bad. each other's economies through. That's um, scary. You know, not an anti-U.S. Uh, you know effort. That's kind of scary, to be honest. I have to say. Well, you know what's also, also interesting though in the in this world of you know, EVs, electric vehicles, 70%, according to the article, said that China's uh, vehicles that they exported were uh, gasoline powered. So, you know, <laughs> Russia's not going down the EV route. They're staying with the gasoline and petrol and all that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, they probably wouldn't anyway. Saying, but the, 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 the biggest importers of Chinese Ele uh, um, um, alternative energy, let's call it, you know, like EVs and hybrids of Chinese cars are Belgium and the UK. And it, I think that's what yeah, you might have no, read. I saw that. No, no, yeah. but it was before that they were, they had a bigger, um, they had bigger exports than Russia before in 2021. No, no, yeah, they do because of the gas powered. But if you take out the gas powered, the electric and hybrids mm -hmm. are mostly going to the, to Europe. Yeah. Which makes sense. For obvious um, reasons, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Anyways, yeah, that's um but wild that China is capable of such. I'm sure J Japan is like hustling now because they don't want to give up their spot. Okay. Yeah, that's what that is. But let me ask you guys. So uh, we we talked about Russia briefly. And I don't know how good you guys' geography is, but what continent do you place Russia on? No, it's Europe. It's literally 
That's what I thought. I did not take it. I did not in my head put Russia in a European, in the European continent. Right. I did not. But it covers and so, actually two sides of that. It? it does. It does. But mostly it is placed in the, in the European continent following the United Nations classification. Isn't that crazy? Really? Yeah. I thought I was stupid. I thought I was like, there's no way Russia's part of Ger- of Germany, of Europe. And I, so I looked it up because someone had said, yeah, I go to Europe a lot. You know, I'm from Russia. And I'm like, I didn't say anything because I was like, wait, maybe I'm just. Well, like, Russia something. is next door to <laughs> Europe and, and the Baltic states as well and, and all that. But I, I mean, it covers. Yeah, but he said I go to Europe a lot. Like, I, I know he meant like he meant Russia part of Europe and he was Russian. He just whatever. And and I was like, well, maybe I'm just not good at geography or something. I'm just not going to say anything. Went home, looked this up, immediately called my mom. And I was like, mom, there's no way Russia is part of Europe. And so, and, and I looked it up and it said that it, it is part of it's that it stretches over Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. However, it is placed in the European continent following the United Nations classification. Well, that's interesting well, only because... Much of its territory lies in Asia, but yeah. most of its people reside in Europe. Okay, well, so. that, I can see that. That's where most of the population then is on the left, uh, the western part of Russia, which borders to what would be, you know, your Euro- European... The eastern side of Europe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I Crazy, would say huh? geographically, the majority of the landmass would be uh, Northern Asia. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the territory lies mostly in Asia, but people live mostly in Europe, which is why I'm assuming that they consider themselves part of Europe. You know? Well, that's a little trivia Weird. fact, isn't it? I, it's, I don't even, like, I don't want to consider Russia part of Europe. So Asia can have Russia. That's totally fine with all of us, I think. Um no, just kidding. We all want peace, and if they want to be part of Europe, they can be. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a little fact. Um, if you have any other analysis, analogies, or whatever, please bring them our way. Um, we're happy to listen, and especially towards our articles. So if you are part of anything that we've talked about or you know more about it, please reach out to us. You can do that email. Um, LinkedIn, you can comment. Well, that's hard. You can comment on YouTube. So we're on YouTube now. So you can comment on YouTube. I was going to say those, YouTube. Yeah, we're getting best. comments on YouTube. Yes, we're getting. But I mean, uh, if you want to be private, do it on email. But YouTube, we see all of your comments and um, we put most of our content up there too. Yeah, starting January 1, we started. Every single episode has been on there. And then we have something called Trade Gems, uh, in case anybody's interested. But Trade Gems takes a full episode, and we only take out the gems of the of the episode. Like we might have seven, six, five, ten, twelve, fifteen minute pieces of the episode that are the biggest takeaways of the episode that you can use as your cliff notes, for for example, of the episode. And if you want, you can later go back and listen to the full episode. That's that for a Monday morning. And for us, it's a Friday. But for you, it's a Monday morning, hopefully, that you're listening right as it comes out. And we hope you have a great week. Um, let's hope that there's only good news, good news, tr- good trait news during the week. Um, anyways, had a great time. See you guys next week. Bye, Lalo and Andy. Bye-bye. Bye, Andy. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or 
You can DM us on Twitter at Simply Trade Pod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.